Thank you, everybody, for coming back in. Welcome back. We know we got a little off schedule today, but we have our ways, and we'll be on back, back on track in a little while this afternoon with little changes we can make. So appreciate how great that last keynote went. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our first panel session this afternoon and its esteemed participants, Ray Haberski, Natalia Mailman Petrozella, and Paul Murphy. They will guide us in our exploration of certain divisive cultural and political problems that have dogged Americans in recent years. These are issues that have required, but have not always received, common ground solutions between left and right. Ray Haberski, President, Professor of History and Director of American Studies at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, is the author of God and War, American Civil Religion Since 1945, and forthcoming, Evangelization to the Heart, A Brief History of American Franciscans and Media. Today, Ray will examine contemporary debate about just war and civil religion. Natalia Mailman Petrozella is Assistant Professor of History at the New School. Issues of gender, race, class, and identity in the politics and culture of the United States are at the heart of her work. Her book, Classroom Wars, Language, Sex, and the Making of Modern Political Culture, examines the culture wars as they have played out in American classrooms. This afternoon, Natalia will be discussing that very topic. Paul Murphy, an intellectual and cultural historian of 20th century America, is the author of The New Era, American Thought and Culture in the 1920s, and The Rebuke of History, The Southern Agrarians in American Conservative Thought. Currently a professor of history at Grand Valley State University, Paul will explore humanism in the 20th century. With that, we welcome our next guests. Thanks, Anne, and thanks to Gleaves and to Joe. This has been a real treat for many of us. Uh, thank you all for coming in from the sunshine. I know it's been a relatively mild winter, but still, it's a beautiful day out there, so we appreciate you being here uh, to join us. This has been a special pleasure for many of us because we see each other occasionally at, at different conferences, um, and often they're, they're rather large, and we don't get a chance to sort of hang out quite this much and have uh, sustained conversations. So part of the community that we like to be involved in is here today, but it also has broadened our community with, uh, with many of the people that we've met for the first time here. So I, we really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to talk about civil religion and just war and a failure of common ground, I guess you could say. So it is, uh, while I, I understand and largely support uh, the mission of this particular conference, uh, my own work makes me wonder if finding common ground in all circumstances is a good thing. I write about seemingly disparate things, movies, civil religion, just war. And like many of the presenters here, my work deals with the messy nature of popular debates about moral issues. Take the case of movie censorship, which was the subject of a couple of books that I've written. Progressives and conservatives made common cause in the 1950s to overthrow the Pural movie codes and then pivoted together in the 1970s to decry the rise of exceedingly violent and sexually exploitative films. In this example, finding common ground did at least gesture towards creating a common good. But let me suggest another example, war. While war has indeed consistently brought together progressives, or perhaps better liberals, and conservatives, I find this unity problematic because at base it often rejects the possibility that such common ground might be a common wrong. Essayist and journalist David Reif, who is the son of Susan Sontag, describes such unanimity as a theology of American exceptionalism. While I think exceptionalism doesn't do justice to the complexity of Reif's point, his description of this idea makes sense. Writing a review of Anne-Marie Slaughter's apology for American imperial ambitions in the war on terror, Reef observed, what no one questions is the certainty that we are capable of, indeed accustomed to exercising moral leadership, and more basically still, that our ideals as a nation entitle us to do so. There is contention as to which American leader is fit to assert it, whether it should be done unilaterally or multilaterally, 
and how much the opinion of the rest of the world should count. Beyond that, there is absolute consensus. Reef captured the tone of the consensus over American moral uh, leadership, but did not dig deeply into its source. So that is what I tried to do in my book, God and War, arguing that the American experience with war makes such consensus not merely possible, but nearly imperative. This afternoon, I want to briefly explore the dubious nature of that consensus and suggest that despite what we might hear about culture wars dividing Americans, real war has had a remarkable and at times insidious power to unite Americans. While I've focused on the longest sustained period of constant war in the nation's history, from 1941 to the present, the roots of such experience lay deep in America's history. Religious historian Harry Stout states bluntly, the norm of American national life is war. From colonial origins to the present, Americans have never seen a generation that was not preoccupied with wars, threats of wars, and military interventions on foreign soils. The reason I call upon Stout here, rather than a military historian, to emphasize the connection between, is, to, is to emphasize the connection between the two most significant cultural influences on American identity, religion and war. American wars are sacred wars, Stout contends. And American religion, with some notable exceptions, is martial at its very core of its being. The ties between war and religion are symbiotic, and the two grow up inextricably intertwined. That relationship between the religious and the martial has so profoundly shaped American character that it shows up in observations by the likes of even Mark Twain. Among the many caustic and perceptive observations Twain made about Americans, one of the most searing was his description of the relationship between God and war in his deadly serious satire, The War Prayer. Observing a celebration of soldiers about to enter the Spanish-American War, Twain wrote, it was indeed a glad and gracious time, and the half dozen rash spirits that ventured to disapprove of war and cast a doubt about it, uh, upon its righteousness straightway got such a stern and angry warning that for their personal safety's sake, they quickly shrank out of sight and offended no more in that way. Now, in the original version of that passage, Twain had tellingly edited out the article, the from the phrase to disapprove of war. He did so, I suggest to you, in order to generalize the emotion he described. Throughout American history, it has generally been sacrilege to refuse to idolize those who fight and at times die in war. Indeed, Twain and Stout remind us not to overlook the cultural power of war. In US intellectual history, we often, and for good reason, Focus on what critics from Randolph Bourne to Andrew Bacevich have noted about the relationship between the state and war, that the power of the state grows exponentially in a time of war. What Twain and Stout observe is a companion to that analysis, that we, the people, sanctify war. This notion is remarkably resilient. Even unpopular wars provide opportunities to see the union of God in war. For example, Next to the, civil, the American Civil War, Vietnam is the war that produced the clearest theological crisis for an American faith in the nation. Martin Luther King expressed that understanding in his famous speech at Riverside Church in April 1967. He said, if America's soul becomes totally poisoned, part of the autopsy must read Vietnam. It can never be saved so long as it destroys the deepest hopes of men the world over. So it is that those of us who are yet determined that, American, that America will be are led down the path of protest and dissent, working for the health of our land. Inspired in large part by King's moral example, sociologist Robert Bella wrote an influential essay called Civil Religion in America in 1967. Bella said in his essay, his essay sprang from concern with the American war in Vietnam. But he admitted that at the time, he wasn't fully aware of the re new religious phenomenon that he had observed. It was, Bella recalled, a sense of moral crisis in the United States being engaged in a war that had such negative qualities to it that made me ask, was there anything in our past that would help us avoid this catastrophe that we're in? Indeed, the Vietnam War made Bella realize that the United States was in the midst of a period of profound doubt about the faith Americans had in the nation itself. 
the prospect of losing its soul forced Bella to consider if America had one. Bella's contribution to the genealogy of civil religion was to see American civil religion as both top-down and bottom-up, that presidents and religious leaders had to contend with and could call upon a collective American faith to justify sacrifice for the nation. In war, an American civil religion was made manifest. Or as Bella famously wrote, civil religion allowed, quote, an understanding of the American experience in the light of ultimate and universal reality, which at its best is a genuine apprehension of universal and transcendent religious reality as seen in, or one could almost say, as revealed through the experience of the American people. My question is, what is revealed when that dominant experience is war? Within a decade of Bella's essay in Civil Religion, Michael Walzer published Just and Unjust Wars and nearly answered Bella's call for a religious perspective on Vietnam. By 1977, scholars and the public alike appeared anxious to embrace just war theory as a way to evaluate the legacy of the Vietnam War and not surprisingly, to orient debates over America as a moral place. In a recent edition of his book, Walter observes, Vietnam is the major reason for the surge in interest in just war theory, but interest has been sustained by America's subsequent wars, which have been greater in number and longer in duration than anyone could have expected. As many of you know, just war provides a systematic way to evaluate how to enter fight and exit a war with particular regard for the use of force, both on the battlefield and against civilians. The promise of just war theory is that it provides a way, supposedly, to prevent states from making war against each other. And while just war theory is not fundamentally Catholic or necessarily Christian, the connection to a church with universal aspirations does not hurt its appeal. However, there is an irony to the rediscovery of civil religion and just war, both developed in response to the perceived problems of the Vietnam War, and both were supposed to help the nation avoid similar mistakes in the future. And while it is true that the United States did not fight another land war in Vietnam, the American experience with war has proven remarkably resilient to, resistant I'm sorry, to critique if civil religion promised a way to identify the soul of the nation and just war offered a systematic way to avoid poisoning that soul through war, then what, for example, should we make of a movie such as Clint Eastwood's American Sniper and the deification of its subject, Chris Kyle? When that movie came out, I religiously went to see it and read posts and comments about it. I was struck by the way the movie seemed to capture the trials of, um, of war in America. While folks divided over what the film said or avoided saying about recent wars, there was near unanimity over how the people should treat the depiction of Kyle. One might respond, yeah, but it's only a movie. Ah, yes, but it's more. It's a blockbuster. And in the age of fracture and culture wars, perhaps blockbusters are one of the only ways we deal with each other's views. American Sniper, quite nearly worships the, uh, the heroics of Navy SEAL Chris Kyle as he performed his duty as a sniper with extraordinary skill during four tours in Iraq. In box office terms, American Sniper became the most popular profitable war movie ever made. It is also among the most revealing politically in the way that Eastwood channeled the popular satisfaction and sanctification of soldiering and avoided asking any questions about why Kyle and his fellow soldiers were in Iraq. In a review that sounds uh, like an extension of David Reif's argument, Rolling Stone's Matt Taibbi made the case for the film as a significant cultural event. The really dangerous part of the film, Taibbi said, is that it turns into a referendum on the character of a single soldier. It's an unwinnable argument in either direction. We end up talking about Chris Kyle and his dilemmas, and not about the Rumsfelds and the Cheneys and other officials up the chain who put Kyle and his high-powered rifle on rooftops in Iraq and asked him to shoot women and children. More to the point, Taibbi said, it's the fact that the movie is popular and, act that, and actually makes sense to so many people. That's the problem. A film that takes an opposing political view but nevertheless demonstrates the same tendencies among the public is the Tillman story. As many of you probably know, 
Pat Tillman was an ex-NFL defensive back who gave up a multi-million dollar contract with the Arizona Cardinals to join the military in the wake of 9-11. Ironically, both Kyle and Tillman were killed by fellow soldiers, though under very different circumstances. The documentary about Tillman looks at the government's production and the public's acceptance of Tillman as a myth. Even though Tillman's family resisted the use of their son to propagate support for the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, their dissident voices met with the same kind of response as the characters in Twain's story. When Tillman's mother Mary was asked about ceremonies honoring her son, she replied, it's not about Pat, it's about the nation. What the Tillmans experienced and Twain depicted is a difficulty of getting out from under the weight of an American theology of war. The axis of civil religion and just war creates this theology. And while these terms can seem a bit squishy, they are also given to a grandiosity of language, and in the case of just war, in Latin, no less. They are heavy. They anchor an actions by connecting the instrumental power of the state to the epistemology of fighting wars. In short, they make why we fight more important than how or when we fight. In a recent postscript to his book, Walter responded to both the critics and the promoters of the academic industry of just war theory by pointing out the, significant, uh, the significance of the collectivist power of war. Uh, Walter says, patriotism and loyalty are no doubt often misguided, but they shouldn't be incomprehensible. Collectives like the state or the army of the state are indeed instrumental. They have no intrinsic value, but they make possible and they defend another collective, a community whose existence is of centrally important value to its members. Walzer forces us to recognize that just war theory relates in concrete terms to the actual of, uh, actuality of fighting and dying in war. The reality of death in war forces a community or a nation to construct an existential reason for such sacrifice. In short, a civil religion of war provides a way to sacralize those who fight. And in the American experience, just war has become little more than the power to demonstrate choosing, between, uh, choosing common ground over a common good. Thank you. Thank my own thanks to Joe, to Anne, to Gleaves for organizing this event and, and inviting me in. What a delight and a pleasure to be on a panel with Ray and Natalia, so I'm um, very honored. In 1930, spokesmen for two very different kinds of humanism shared a common ground, literally, when they were scheduled to give rival lectures in New York within six days of each other. The Harvard professor of literature and languages, Irving Babbitt, and others faced down the noted literary critics Henry Seidel Camby and Carl Van Doren at Carnegie Hall on May 9th, and the former Unitarian minister, Charles Francis Potter, who had established the first humanist society of New York, debated Unitarian pastor Leon Rosser Land in the Bronx on May 15th. The two debates were, in fact, quite different. Although a New York Times notice confusingly conflated their topics, announcing that the conservative Babbitt who was in the midst of a contentious debate with most of the nation's literary establishment over the value of modern literature, and the free-thinking Potter, who had left the Unitarian Church to establish a non-theistic religious congregation, were both going to defend humanists against those who believed in God. In fact, they were on opposite sides of the cultural schisms of their day. Babbitt was defending a program of cultural conservatism. Potter was attacking religious superstition in the name of scientific rationality. The journalists might be forgiven the confusion, however, for each represented movements that took as their name the same term. They called themselves the New Humanists. I would like to consider these two very distinctive New Humanisms of the early 20th century as embodiments of the progressive conservative split that is the subject of our summit today. Despite their relative physical and temporal proximity in 1930, the two new humanisms actually existed in something like rival intellectual universes. The literary combatants inhabited university literature departments, literary journals, and the literary sections of the major journals of opinion, 
The religious disputants lived in university theology departments, divinity schools, Unitarian pulpits, and religious and theological journals. The literary New Humanists were the more well-known, uh, overshadowing the, the liberal proponents of non-theistic religion who shared the same name, which sometimes provoked annoyed commentary from the latter. The literary humanists were also self-consciously and proudly conservative. Both Babbitt and Paul Elmer Moore, who was the other principal leader of the movement, were elitist and ardently conservative, if not reactionary. They opposed social reform generally, as well as socialism, direct democracy, the centralized state, feminism. The non-theistic religious humanist Unitarian come-outers who had fought for the right of ministers in that denomination to have freedom of, freedom of conscience, even if extended to a disavowal of any belief in God, to have freedom of the pulpit as well as the freedom of the pew, were Dewey and progressives. In fact, John Dewey signed their most notable statement, the Humanist Manifesto of 1933, which among other things called for a, quote, socialized and cooperative economic order. So, what can be learned from these two very different groups who had chosen the identical label of the new humanism, what now seems an unfortunate instance of unintentionally contradictory cross-branding? Does the episode reveal the origins of our modern progressive conservative split to be in the 1920s, the primordial birth of modern polarization and division? Maybe. Uh, but I'd rather pursue two other points, one highlighting commonality, if not common ground, and one disjunction. There is something in a name, and the rival conservative and progressive New Humanist shared a socio-historical assumption bound up with that name, which, which gave what it named a cultural program about defining values, weight, and significance. What divided them was modernity, and the question of how to live in modernity. The conservative humanist represented tradition and were in many ways throwbacks to the Victorian era. The liberal non-theistic religious humanists were advocates for modernity, steeped in the spirit that led John Dewey in 1934 to call for a new common, common faith that would be scientific rationality and quote, the continued disclosing of truth through directed cooperative human endeavor. Their rival positions on progress led to competing beliefs on the appropriate personal response to the conditions of modern life. They otherwise shared, I believe, even if it was unrecognized though, a common ground. So first, the word. Humanism was a term that was very much in the air in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, equally on the lips of the socialistic dreamer and the exponent of the latest philosophical fad, as Babbitt noted in 1908. Although though derived from a Latin root, the noun humanism uh, did not exist in ancient or medieval Latin, and versions only appeared in modern European languages in the 19th century. For example, the German humanismus, uh, which referred to a traditionalist uh, pedagogical program in classical, religious, and patriotic study uh, as a counter to progressive educational ideas. Humanism was also applied to unorthodox Christian thinkers. It was affixed to English Unitarianism, early in the 19th century, and, and to rationalistic three, free thinkers. Babbitt and his literary confreres were picking up the first usage, generally, as they evinced a strong interest in classical values and the teaching of modern literature. The non-theistic religious humanists took up the latter. But in the American context, the term developed a distinctive meaning, I would say. The conservative new humanists were concerned, above all, with modern civilization. But, as Babbitt noted, the term came to have a broader application that transcended pedagogical programs or religious unorthodoxy. Humanism came to mean, I would argue, choosing to live according to values. As an example, take Albert Eustace Hayden, a Canadian professor of comparative religion at the University of Chicago Divinity School, and author of a book called The Quest of the Ages, published in 1929. A, a historical and theoretical account of the evolution of religion in human history. Hayden began as a Baptist minister, but gradually questioned the tenets of his faith, eventually completing a dissertation on the conception of God in the pragmatic philosophy at the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago was a bastion of American liberal and modernist theologians who 
who reconceived God as an imminent, imminent force in nature and culture. And under the influence of the 19th century uh, Prussian theologian Albrecht Rieschel redefined religion in terms of values and moral goods. In the quest of the ages, Hayden wrote of religion as simply the shared quest for the good life. Progress consisted of moving beyond supernaturalism to science, including the scientific study of religion. In sociological and historical terms, religion represented the expression of a society's deeper social ideal. But both the form and meaning of a culture's God are determined by underlying social values. In religion, social values are defined. Religion becomes, in Hayden's words, quote, the quest for the values of the good life to be enjoyed by all. The point was reiterated by Roy Wood Sellers, a University of Michigan philosopher who developed a sideline in advocating humanism uh, as an alternative to orthodox religion. Quote, the deepest spiritual life has always concerned itself with the appreciation and maintenance of values, Sellers declared in The Next Step in Religion, which was published in 1918. Wherever there are genuine values, there is spiritual, uh, the spiritual, he observed. Is not loyalty to these spiritual values of human life coming to be the sole meaning of religion? Uh, religion is just that, loyalty to the values of life. Something similar can be found in Walter Lippmann's preface to Morals, uh, 1929, which he both, in which he both summed up the state of progressive moral theory and tried his hand at formulating and justifying his own humanism to replace outworn and what he considered unbelievable ideas of God, which, as with all traditions and orthodoxies, were fatally undermined by the corrosive acids of modernity in his famous phrase. Modern men were experiencing a sort of midlife crisis Lippmann proposed, and the solution lay in modern social science, particularly developmental psychology, which provided the key to the cultivation of a mature character marked by new values, disinterestedness, tolerance, open-mindedness, the coolness of scientific rationality. Pure science, he wrote, was, quote, high religion incarnate. The goal of humanism would be the achievement of a harmonious and autonomous personality, the attainment of self-governing maturity. An understanding of this progress from infantile to mature experience constituted the matrix of humanism. The creation of a clear moral way was an essential feature of any civilization which becomes coherent and confident when all are in possession of clear knowledge of its ideals. Such value definition was of the essence of literary humanism as well. In Babbitt's seminal study, Literature in the American College, Humanism described the process of cultivating the complete man, which turned on the inculcation of what for Babbitt was the supreme law of life, the law of measure. This was a law intuited from a self aligned with the absolute, a proposition that Lippmann, who was actually a disaffected student of Babbitt's, had come to find preposterous in preface to morals. Yet the two men found common ground in imagining humanism as the modern cultural program of defining and living by moral values. Babbitt appealed to Rolf Waldo Emerson's double consciousness of a law for man and a law for thing, finding in it a validation of his own injunction to live by a traditional discipline of moderation and balance, which he found self-evident and, and venerable, a long-held insight of moral philosophy. If the usage of humanism was relatively recent. Uh, the use of the term values to refer to, a pers to personal or social moral standards or principles was arguably even more so, with the Oxford English Dictionary tracing it only to the mid-19th century, with the earliest usage attributed to Emerson himself in 1844, commenting on how commerce makes of government a source of information about everything for sale, whether goods or, quote, intellectual and moral values. Babbitt, Lippmann, and Hayden, humanists of all stripes in the early 20th century, conceived their project as a program for the definition of some set of uh, formulas or values, uh, 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 making values the new authority by which we should and must now live, replacing in many ways religious authorities. The conservative and liberal new humanist derived their program from the 19th century tradition of self-culture and character, a widely influential set of beliefs shaped by 18th century faculty psychology, which distinguished between higher and lower selves, profoundly influenced Unitarianism, 
and was premised on a faith in the rational will as the basis of moral selfhood. This was a tradition of thinking that formed the basis of a uh, 19th century understanding of culture which was supplanted in the 1920s by a newer anthropological sense of culture as the generalized patterns of learned beliefs and behaviors, a frame of reference that determined personality and ideology. Now, as I come to my second and concluding point, it is worth emphasizing this common ground shared by the conservatives and the, li the liberal or progressive literary hum uh, uh, humanists, Lippmann and maybe even many more people. In response to the acids of modernity which undercut religious authority and introduced manifold new forms of knowledge, they were advocating humanism or the capacity to choose to live according to values as the essential answer to the political, moral, and socioeconomic quandaries posed by the flux of modern experience. This led to an understanding of civilization as most importantly defined by values, which were essentially only ideas, which in turn were most clearly understood through the construction of intellectual genealogies. There is a strong odor of intellectual history in this approach, as one detects amongst these conservative and progressive forebears an immense faith in ideas and a stubborn and perhaps willful insistence that history be understood not in social or economic terms, but in intellectual terms. For all that, the response to this modern condition differed in an essential way. To progressive humanists, humanism as the process of creating values to guide modern life promised a way to be at home in the modern world. Let us again use Lippmann as an example. Lippmann depicted modern man's predicament which was uh, uh, due to a loss of authority, as both a midlife crisis, which happened as man groped his way to a mature understanding of the universe, no longer uh, with a childish reliance upon an imagined father, but also as a loss of place. Man lost the, quote, fixed point that had previously guided him. The modern landscape afforded no physical analogs for eternal verities. In the past, quote, Ancient authorities were blended with the ancient landmarks, with fields and vineyards and patriarchal trees, with ancient houses and chests full of heirlooms, with churchyards near at hand and their ancestral graves, with old men who remembered wise sayings they had heard from wise old men. The, the end of that quotation. The modern person was now alone, physically displaced. Nietzsche spoke for all, Lippmann noted near the beginning of preface, when he cried, where is my home? The need Lippmann recognized was for security, a sense of being at home again, or the ability to navigate confidently in a world that was not one's own. This was a sentiment echoed by Hayden in The Quest of the Ages. Humanism as a way of living entailed the decision to look within for values and to human history for fulfillment as opposed to the kingdom of God. Hayden warned against a failure of nerve. The task of today, Hayden argued, is to continue the quest for the values of the noblest ideal of living, which is to say, to use the scientific method, the knowledge gained from the social sciences, the wealth achieved by material growth, and the cultural heritage of the past to create a new religious synthesis. The goal would be, quote unquote, at homeness in the world. Quote, to feel at home in the universe was and is an achievement. It is perhaps here, in the conflict between tradition and progress, figured as the distinction between alienation and feeling at home, uh, that the common ground failed. Not a split over the desire for security, but a division over where security would be found. Lippmann had put his finger on it. Babbitt and the other new humanist remained invested in what was very old, the ancient landmarks and the chests full of heirlooms, the patriarchal trees and the graveyards. These fixed points marked the vital cutting point between these two brands of American humanism. For the Dewey and religious humanist, living by values defined as ideas required exercising a new learning in ad adopting a science and, and an entire set of ethical principles entailed in it, in embracing values ranging from open-mindedness to tolerance to fallibilism. The literary humanist saw only the need for creating new versions of old truths. The message of the literary new humanist was not to be at home in modernity, but to be alienated from it. Not to embrace science, but to accept it grudgingly, and certainly not as the source of values. As one of Babbitt's debate partners at Carnegie, Hill in May 19 uh, Carnegie Hall sorry, in May 1930 had noted elsewhere of the literary new humanism, 
it, it is a very porcupine hunched up against the familiar world. Conservatives in this traditionalist vein tended to reconstruct a history of Western civilization in which some intellect, intellectual development marked the point at which everything after went terribly wrong, whether it was the nominalism of William of Ockham, Richard Weaver, or the romanticism introduced by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Babbitt. It is a tendency nicely illustrated by Joseph Wood Crotch in his, distinct, uh, his anguished account of the modern temper. Lippmann attributed change to the acids of modernity. In Crotch's analysis, however, mind itself was the antagonist. What man knows is everywhere at war with what he wants, he wrote. Rather than clarify moral issues, the knowledge born of science only made moral principles less distinct. Humanist intellectuals did not create new values to fit a modern age, Crotch concluded, but rather attempted to preserve the older values even while accepting the new dispensation of science. And this, for Crotch, occupying a distinct and independent stance, all his own, knowledge entailed an estrangement, uh, not uh, swaged by a felt sense of maturity or a common faith in the truth disclosed by cooperative human endeavor. We have come to realize, he observed, that the more we learn of the laws of that universe in which we constitute a strange incongruity, the less we shall feel at home in it. Changes in values, quote, have a far more profound effect upon man than any mere changes of government, for they are in effect changes of God, and they involve a change both in his whole conception of the meaning of the universe and in the thing for which he lives. So to conclude, in our own day of the rationalization, bureaucratization, and corporatization of intellectual life in which our leaders often profess the importance of values but more often invest in technological solutions, in which higher education is increasingly about training students in valuable skills and not so much in how to know the values by which we should live, what these rival humanists had in common may be more striking than what divided them. The ideology of culture, the conviction that ideas define civilization and that rationality and self-culture define self, collapsed after the 1920s. For all their ideological differences, conservative and progressive humanists were concerned with the quest for values as the most essential civilizational task. In this sense, they shared an intellectual world, narrow and insular in many ways, to be sure, very different from the one which, in which we are at home. It is worth noting that humanist thinking did not vouchsafe harmony and agreement, though many humanists thought their own values would be uh, perfect as the basis for agreement. Quite the opposite, humanist claims generated conflict. It is important to remember, too, how much was at stake in these debates between tradition and science, order and change, the old and the new. Babbitt equated Rousseauian romanticism with modernity. To him, they both were about losing self-control. However, we might note the lonely voices in these long-ago debates about humanism that staked out a common ground in other ways. Henry Seidel Canby, a sympathetic but tough critic of the conservative new humanist, suggested that humanism, the response of a civilized man to anything that warped his nature, might be, only the antidote, might be the only antidote to the poison of mechanism, which reduced civilization to only a, quote, vast machine for production and consumption. He warned of what he called, a wonderful term, the, the Pluto-democratic age of machines. Or he might heed Lewis Mumford, who decried both the conservative humanist and the utilitarian pragmatist. Humanism, rightly understood, he argued, should offer positive channels of effort, dignified tasks, fine and significant actions, and quiet quiet states of beatitude. Mumford presented himself as a critic of both the new humanism and what he styled the new mechanism, which subordinated human needs to material progress and endorsed the division of man from nature. Mumford provided no answer, only calling for what we are doing today, the seeking of a modern synthesis and a restoration of ideologies, the mating of progress and tradition, perhaps, some sort of new philosophy, new aesthetic, a new theology, that would express the personality as a whole, as he said, and, quote, seek to make the facts conform to the needs of the personality rather than the opposite. Thanks. I'll echo the thanks of everybody else for being here. It's uh, a great honor, and I should say that when I received the kind invitation to be here, I first thought, okay, talking about progressivism and conservatism, that sounds very interesting, you know, but not totally path-breaking, and then I thought, wait, with progressives and conservatives on the stage and in the room, there's something new. And so I think it's quite telling that that's such an exciting prospect, and also that it has to be so deliberate for us to come together to have these discussions. So that only uh, intensifies um, the honor that I feel to be here.
So um, we're here to talk about common ground, but as the title of my talk suggests, I've spent uh, more than the last decade actually looking for the opposite of common ground, which was examples of classroom wars or fights in education. And so I'm gonna talk about that, but um, the theme of this conference was a wonderful occasion for me to actually look through all these deliberate examples of intense controversy in the classroom and think about, well, what examples of common ground, some of them surprising, have I actually discovered? What have been the limits of those examples of common ground. And so I'll offer um, an example that I think encapsulates the period that I study of the 1960s. Um, and then maybe, as historians hate to do, but I might venture to even talk a little bit about the implications for the contemporary era. So bear with me. Um, so first of all, why study schools? Why study conflicts in schools? I'll tell you why that, those questions animate me so um, with such passion. So my hunch then, and what's became, become really a governing assumption of my work, is that fights about curriculum, fights about education, are about very discrete issues. And as historians, we like discrete issues because they leave paper trails and people, you know, uh, show up at school board meetings and they talk explicitly about things. But that even as they engage discrete issues, that they tend to be about much, much larger social questions, that people get so exercised about what happens in their children's classroom, because quite understandably, and I'm sure there are some parents in the audience, I'm a parent myself, quite understandably, we stake a lot on our public schools, on what our children are being taught away from our watchful eyes. And so, Sometimes the kind of grander implications or the grander stakes of these curricular struggles are very, very obvious. And just um, a few examples from what I study. Well, uh, in the early 1960s and throughout the 1960s, there was a proliferation of kind of newly open sex education programs. This is very obviously an outgrowth in some ways um, of the sexual revolution. More looser mores around sexuality lead to uh, a more relaxed attitude about talking about these things with children. With that, as happened outside the classroom, there was understandably a conservative reaction to this. And in the conservative reaction in particular, very, very rarely did people who were resisting sex education, in one town they came to be known as the antis, which they called themselves as well, but the anti articulation of the problem with sex education was never really about any particular curriculum, any particular textbook. It was, this is a communist plot to undermine the American family. This is a communist plot to turn children's morality away from the family, from the United States, Sometimes it was said to um, undermine gender roles. One newsletter that, I, um, often, that I've used in my research of a parent group against sex education just wrote across the top, do you want California schools to look like Sweden, right? And so the idea was social democracy, changes in uh, traditional gender roles, this all lay in the balance. Similarly, the civil rights movements of the same era, again, intuitively, they gave rise to their educational counterparts, calls for more inclusive curricula around race, ethnicity, and language, programs like African American studies, Chicano studies grew out of this, calls for greater diversity on the faculty, and um, the reaction came just as strongly. And often it was structured particularly in what I look at around this Chicano studies imperative, bilingual education, it was structured around anxiety about the Immigration Act of 1965, right? The doors are open now. What America is becoming is not what it was, and ground zero for this activity is in the schoolhouse. We've got to stop it here. We start, our, we start uh, recognizing foreign languages, which was really code for Spanish, because that was the main one in stake in, the, in this era. We start recognizing foreign languages. The American way of life is in peril. And then sometimes these grander cultural movements would interlock. It wasn't always just one manifesting in a curriculum. And one good study, one, one good example which had national implications was a curriculum, some of you may remember, called MAN, A Course of Study. Um, does anybody has an, I nod your head? Yeah, a few of you recognize it. So this was a social studies curriculum in the early 1970s, very much a progressive education uh, 
initiative, and in one very controversial lesson, um, an, an Eskimo family leaves an elderly, uh, an elderly member of the family behind because there's not enough resources and they have to like go on, go on with their lives. It's a decision that they make. This caused massive controversy. So on the one hand, this thing was implemented because of this new movement in education, a new kind of respect for progressive methods, a new in inclusion of non-Western cultures in the schoolhouse, but the reaction hearkened directly to larger, I think, anxieties about the generation gap, where young kids are becoming so disconnected from their parents, from their grandparents, that they could do something like leave grandma behind in a moment of great duress, um, concerns as well about um, really family values being at stake. And this is around the era that the term family values would really started um, to become used, and, and on the ground, I should say that. Um, so uh, unsurprisingly, I mean, all these examples I chose are from the 60s and 70s, and this was really a hotbed of social change and contestation of the social change, and the schools reflected that. But now the language of the culture wars, which itself is much contested, often, I'm not the only one in this room who's been asked, and why even use the term the culture wars? But maybe you'll ask me that later. But the term the culture wars presumes these two poles, right? Progressive, conservative, liberal, conservative. But what I actually found was that it was not always the case that there were these two fixed identities in kind of predictable opposition, you know, ideologically locking horns all the time. Actually, when you start looking at the way these things play out on the ground, there are lots of unexpected examples about how the conservative you thought would never get on board with this putatively progressive thing actually kind of liked it and vice versa. And I'll offer you a couple of what I think are illustrative examples. And I do this, by the way, um, to shake up our sense that progressive and conservative in any historical era are all in inclusive or um, monolithic or rigid categories. I think that as much as it can seem so, certainly in that polarized era and in ours today, hopefully there's a little bit more fluidity um, than we may often assume. So a guy named Max Rafferty, who was the superintendent of California schools from 1962 to 1970, and had a fairly major media presence. He was a conservative columnist. He was a Republican candidate for US Senate from California in 1968. He ended up losing to a Democrat, Alan Cranston. He really became known as the kind of symbol of this rise of the right um, educational conservatism. However, what I learned in studying him is just a couple years before he was the Republican candidate in 1966, he'd actually gone to meet with the Minister of Education in Mexico and said, you know what we need? We need more teacher exchanges. You know what we need? More Spanish textbooks in our schools. You know what I think? Every Anglo child should have just as much a responsibility to learn Spanish as um, Hispanic kids have to learn English. That is a position that today is untenable, I would argue, um, given, untenable for conservatives, given our current discourse around building a wall and immigration. And um, in that period, he was able to maintain that. And he's somebody who really had an identity as a um, rock-ribbed conservative. Very similarly, this was happening on the ground, not just um, in you know, the case of prominent political figures. Mexican Americans were often assumed to wholly back this kind of ethnic rights agenda. But I um, found on no, you know, no, a very public place, the op-ed page of the Los Angeles Times, a Mexican American mother who wrote it and she said, I don't know what all the fuss is about. Why are you assuming that my child can't learn from a blonde haired, blue eyed teacher? I did. It's racist for you to assume otherwise. It's a point that is often forgotten in this polarizing narrative. Um, as well, you know, to have, um, if you think about the way bilingual education programs often work on the, on the ground, you need to have a critical mass of English language learners grouped together in order to merit the funding for these programs. There were other Mexican-American parents who said, wait a minute, hasn't the whole civil rights struggle been about integration? We want our kid, we don't want you to warehouse our kids alone in order for them to have special educational arrangements. That's not justice. That's not what we came to this country for. So I think that, um, I think that th th those are, are useful examples to think about the way these groups are qualified. Um, and uh, similarly, on this case of sex education, there is probably where the tenor of the 
of the rhetoric was most intense. And there, even the so-called radical sex education programs, which were seen to be communist plots to undermine um, you know, everything good in American society, one sex educator in a community which got national attention for being one of the most forward-thinking sex ed programs. So you think if anything radical is happening, it's probably happening here. She said, yeah, we talk about sex with the kids, but we talk about it, you know, to steer them toward the right conclusion. So what was the right, con first of all, that in itself is a clear kind of moral instruction going on in, in the schoolhouse. Secondly, what was the right conclusion? Well, she didn't say it in that interview, but I looked at countless textbooks from this period Pretty much every single one culminates in 12th grade with a lesson on managing a heterosexual marriage and managing a home. So the right conclusion was a very actually traditional outcome. And um, if you look more deeply at these, you kind of see I would argue more traditional mores around sexuality and gender playing out, particularly around girls. I mean, girls, I, I found this treasure trove of sources, which was class evaluations of a sex ed class. And so I was able to see what the kids got out of it. And, you know, that's like historian, I don't know, trove of gold. And uh, so I started reading. And so one girl said, I'm so happy we saw this class. We had this class. If I didn't have this class, which in her school was called Senior Problems, they were most never had sex in the title because that was a red flag. I'm so happy we had this class. If we hadn't had this class, I wouldn't have known that petting could lead me to ruin. Right? So isn't that interesting? This is the radical undermining agenda of American, uh, you know, everything. So I think that that's really interesting. And, you know, with... Um, boys, the message was not so heavy handed and there certainly was some path breaking language around particularly the kind of demystification of masturbation and that caused a lot of controversy. But um, it also in that student evaluation box, I got a, a note from, I saw a note from a boy and a boy said, you know, it was so great that somebody would finally talk open about homosexuality. And I'm thinking, whoa, this really was, I understand the conservative critique of this for sure. And then he said, because if I didn't know about them, I wouldn't know how sick they were and how much we need to help them. And so really it, it is very humbling too as a historian of education. You think you know, right, when you see um, a curriculum, but you really have no idea. And of course, student evaluations don't tell you the truth. They certainly nuance the picture. So, um, and then, so these are just examples about how what seem to be the poles in these culture wars arguments are always a lot more complicated than they seem. And um, of course, if you, I think we would all be making an error to say progressive conservative always lines up with Democratic Republican, it doesn't. But throughout this whole era, there is just example after example, particularly of moderate Republicans being on the side of civil rights in a very, very energetic way. And I think that's important to remember. Um, but so these are all, in individual examples, right? Individual curricular examples. But I've got something bigger for you that I discovered in this era, which sadly I think has passed. What I found was that the share, the common ground that existed in this period, whether you were brown beret, militant Chicano activist walking out of school, or the members of the citizens, uh, what was it, the Citizens Committee of California who had organized for Goldwater and then turned to educational reform, they all had this faith that public public schools were worth fighting for and worth paying for. There was like this 15 year, and I think it's more, I actually think it's, it goes at least until um, the post-World War II period, but certainly throughout much of the 70s and, and the 1960s, there, they're fighting bitterly, so, so bitterly. These people have very, nothing in common. What can they agree on? Public schools are worth that fight. And of course, they were fighting to win their way. And they thought that the other way was a really um, pernicious um, threat to all of humanity. But I think that that moment has passed. And so I want to talk a little bit about the way that that passed. So backtracking for a moment, just to emphasize how um, special that commonality was. I mean, American public schools are, of course, not that old. The common school era of the 1830s and the 1840s was a century and plus before this era that I'm talking about. And if you think about how hard Horace Mann and his fellow co common, schools reform common school reformers had to fight to get individual localities to put the money up and also to put their kids up, right? To 
be out of their care, um, I think that it, it, it is really remarkable. Of course, that resistance only um, intensified, even as more and more children were going to school throughout the 19th century and really throughout American history, of course, hastened um, or very much expanded by the emancipation of, of black slave children um, who very eagerly sought out these opportunities. There's also really powerful resistance, particularly in this era of great immigration um, from Southern and Eastern Europe, when compulsory education laws stepped up, and also when the Americanization project of American schools stepped up as well. And some immigrants very readily saw this as an opportunity, but many, I think, quite rightfully also resisted it. And so it doesn't go without saying that, of course, people would fight for public schools. And um, to give you a sense of how loudly we heard that across the board. And you might have noticed by now, if you're listening, I hope you are, that um, most of my examples come from California. And the reason my book is about California, but it's, I, I like to think of California as not just a regional example, but um, particularly during this period, but I think it, it, it always is unique in this way. You really can see this um, swath of American political culture there, right? I mean, to use very oversimplified terms, which I spend most of my book undoing, if you think about Orange County conservatives and kind of of Berkeley radicals, I mean, and operating in this period under a very uniquely centralized education system, you get some sense of the kind of national political culture from that, um, from, from, from looking at that space. And um, I'll say, you know, one example, the, the, there is a group of, of Mexican American, or not a Mexican American, Central American uh, young men who are known as Los Siete de la Raza in 1969, who were prosecuted for the murder of a policeman. They were later acquitted, but it became a huge social justice cause. And one of their main points was the public schools let us down. The public schools didn't educate us for any kind of social advancement, and they sure didn't educate white kids to appreciate us, to understand us, or to be anything but um, racist. Um, the protesters of Chicano students who walked out of schools in this period um, were similarly walking out, might sound like they were you know, saying we don't want to be in school. On the contrary, they wanted their demands heard to change those schools that they believed in. Um, so I want to just move forward a little bit. Um, oh yeah, and so I think that also to the point of California being a, um, a place that people look to, what I was remarkable that I found is that from all over the country, people from all over the political spectrum were watching to see what California schools were doing. If you look at the letters that came in, New Jersey, Texas, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and although we often think of cultural transfer as moving east to west, and it's for sure that many people who went westward went with a sense of kind of doing things differently than things are done back east. There was all this talk about California schools on the east coast of either watch out, those California kooks are already doing this in the schools, or wow, there's some really interesting stuff going on there. And so I think that that, that kind of makes the case for na national importance as well. But by the late 1970s, this uh, sense of shared possibility in the public schools was absolutely um, declining. The most concrete example of this is the passage of, the, of Proposition 13 in 1978, the tax revolt, which went on to have national reverberations, which I argue came out in many ways of a dissolution with public education, but certainly did a lot to um, kill public education, although it's, it's, it's not quite dead yet, so to really damage public education in um, California. But then in this period, you also have um, among I think people who would identify as conservative are kind of stepping back from the schools, feeling that multiculturalism has won the day, moving towards, the, there's a huge rise in homeschooling, in Christian schooling in this period, in parochial schooling for that generation of Mexican Americans who gets a little bit more of um, financial stability. And then also in this morning's keynote, Kevin Schultz talks about these extremes of anger and irony. I think you see that happening on both sides. You also see on the left a kind of loss of this idea idealism, um, a greater awareness of the fact that desegregation, there was a lot of foot dragging to put it nicely there. The racial achievement gap is becoming quite apparent, not to mention the rise of mass incarceration after the 1970s and more and more people equating schools and prisons as not being that different from one another. Um, so you know, that's a kind of sad, that shows the limits of the common ground I saw in that period, and um, the, the time is upon me. But um, I wanna just plant here, and maybe we can talk about it in, in, the, in the question and answer, that is there a new common ground forming? 
In some ways we are in an age of fracture and it's very hard to see that around schools. But I will say that I see a common ground I'm a little bit or more than a little bit uncomfortable with forming around schools, which is this kind of central, um, this kind of dominant market approach to education among liberals and conservatives. That if you look at Quant the rise of quantification and performance measures, the kind of widespread anti-union sentiment which is common among the charter school movement, which is another very, very big um, uh, movement in, in, in American education. I think that all of this kind of speaks to this kind of marketization of American schooling, a new consensus, not a, not a total consensus because there are lots of critics of this, but surprising coherence between some, as, some dimensions of American liberals and conservatives around this question. And I'll close with one um, point, which, with one example, which is that there is a charter school, and I'm saying nothing bad about their pedagogy, but there's a charter school in New York City, um, and, a network called the Uncommon Schools Network. And while obviously they're using uncommon to say we are not mediocre, we are exceptional, to me that uncommonness Uncommon schools is such an assault on whatever Horace Mann first dreamed of, this public education being an organizing idea for American children and for the American polity, that I think that really speaks to this new distinction of we're creating schools for some kids, right? They're not, they're certainly not for everybody, and that that's like a branding technique, not something to be hidden. So um, perhaps we can critique that common ground and find a new one or a better one. Thank you very much. Take questions. Yeah, oh yes, I'm supposed to say that. Questions. <laughs> Any uncommon question? Exactly. I know. We were so good. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Nothing left unanswered. <laughs> Well, you told me I should ask something, so I will. Yeah, I, I did. Um, so my question is, is for you, actually, uh, Professor Haberski, um, and it's about the exceptionalism mm -hmm. of what you've discussed. You, you, you talked about uh, American civil religion and the connections between war, and the sacralization of war, the sacralization of the nation, or what, of course, Sidney Mead referred to as America as a nation with the soul of a church. Wonderful phrase. Uh, what I'm wondering is, how is America any different from any other nation at any other time in this sort of sacralization? I can think of some counterexamples, such as the demilitarized uh, Axis states in the 60s and 70s, and even to today, uh, where, where war is not sacralized, perhaps, as it oh, is yeah, here. Right, but, right. but how, isn't every nation a nation with the soul of a church? And every war, a yeah, war and with the soul I, of a I church? Mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. There's not, uh, it's not the civil religion and the United States is not the only one that can claim it um, philosophically. Or, but it is, uh, it, there is a uniqueness to the experience of a nation. And it's through that experience that people begin to create um, traditions that they do worship to a certain sense, right, in a certain way. And then you can see that filter into the political language of everybody from preachers to presidents, but it also filters up from the people. It doesn't, if it doesn't make sense to them, you're not going to use it. So over time, you can see a certain type of theological language uh, sort of bounce around throughout American history. And, and I think in times of war, it becomes especially pronounced because it's in times of war that people are being asked to do things that they don't do any other time, right? They're being asked to kill and die for this uh, ambiguous nation, this idea. Um, and it's one of the things that David Reef, I think, what he tries to hit on is that we don't question what the political entity is anymore, right? We just, we just sort of, we assume we know what the collection of ideas uh, is in the nation. Um, even if we don't necessarily, we talk about conservatives and progressives debating particular ideas, but when it comes to war, it's amazing how often we don't actually interrogate why we're there or why we're asking people to kill and die, you yeah, know, so. So then is this, is this a feature of, of nationalism? Is this something that sure. all nationalist societies have? Uh, is, is civil religion a function of nationalism? Civil or? religion, yes. It, it is to some extent, right? I mean, it, it could be, right, sometimes it could be dumbed down or simplified into patriotism, but I also think that civil religion is used by people who critique uh, the nation, right? I think Martin Luther King, when he talks about the soul of the nation being poisoned by Vietnam, he is using civil religion 
to push people into a discussion about what is happening to the country in a time of war. Mark Twain was doing the same thing. Lincoln did the same thing. Uh, George McGovern did it. Mark Hatfield did it. Uh, I think that's the difference between nationalism, patriotism, and civil religion. There is this mechanism within it to critique the thing that you are praising or worshiping or idolizing to some extent and to ask, why are we doing this? Uh, what are the implications of it? Uh, um, how far do you actually want to go? So, but those are great questions, Jeremy. Thanks. So this could be for any of you or all three of you. It seems like all three of you, one of your either um, straightforward or underlying messages is that common ground is not a desirable end in and of itself. When common ground is what we achieve around issues of war or the marketization of schools or um, I guess the vocationalization, vocationalism of education. Um, so can you speak to that? <laughs> Next. Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, common ground is a nice idea, and I mean, it's a great idea, but I think that particularly in this example that I ended on, I feel like we in schools right now have all, not all, again, I don't want to say all, but the common ground I see is this, um, consensus around this kind of middling kind of marketization of schools that is okay with, you know, for-profit charter management organizations running schools and then they all sound kind of progressive because they're named the Thurgood Marshall Academy or even the Paulo Freire Academy, so they have this kind of lefty cast to them when they're essentially segregated schools. I'm certainly not the only person to be saying this, but, you know, there has been it's a lot of the people who are the engines of this, I think, are kind of very well-meaning um, liberals and conservatives, none of them who are aiming to kind of keep a perpetual underclass of children. But I don't think that the current scenario is doing anybody any favors. And it's almost more damaging um, because it's cloaked in this language of empowering, of empowerment, which I think masks some of its darker implications. I, I think it depends a lot on what you mean by common ground, right? I mean, common ground could be shared values or shared rules of the road, right? Everybody agrees to uh, certain kind of rules, and after that you can disagree a lot. Or, or it's the mushy middle, like the compromise, the bi uh, uh, centrism, <laughs> you know, uh, which is unsatisfactory to everybody. Now, or it can be something a little bit different, right? Uh, and I think what Kevin's talk was getting at with Buckley and Mailer is that, as they take it, the assumption is that they're, they're, they believe in completely, utterly different things. They have utterly different visions of the country. And yet, they believe that what's essential to the country is some sort of um, framework in which democratic processes occur and dialogue happens. And uh, as con contentious and disputed as those things are, um, that's where it occurs. Um, uh, so perhaps that's a shared consensus, although it's sometimes hard to see it in those two. Or maybe it's a shared commitment to institutions, or maybe it's a shared commitment to a kind of rule of the road or process. And so I think that that maybe is what's coming out in the common mm -hmm. the school debates about sex education is that um, you can still keep it together as long as you agree that there's something valuable by which all the kids are going to come together, and you know you can fight over what it's going to be, but you want to all be on the page that you believe in that. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to me. One of the things that occurred to me when you, the vocationalism, it's, it's interesting to see how these humanists who are sort of polarized in different uh, ideological opinions and really in different intellectual worlds, right? They're just not even communicating in a way. Uh, and it almost seems like they're so committed to the intellectual life and to a, a belief in academy and intellectual life as creating the values that we now need to do ourselves to make a good world that they don't see what's coming, which is a kind of devaluation of all that <laughs> and a creation of various kinds of um, institutions and dynamics within institutions that are maybe fundamentally market driven that, um, that degrade that sort of process that they all would have agreed on is the ultimate um, thing that they most believe. So, so maybe the common ground is, is often something we m miss because it's all around us <laughs> and we get caught up in our own in, in, in intramural disputes about things that are important. I'll just mention one thing. I mean, civil religion is almost, uh, by default, common ground, and yet uh, one of the problems here, the other side to the, the, the King quote, is that when King made that speech, it was a speech for which he was roundly criticized because uh, as a civil rights leader, 
uh, most people said, including his, some of his friends, he shouldn't be talking about war or foreign policy, which is outrageous. But the reason why I think people said that at the time is that he was one step away from saying the people who are killing and dying in Vietnam are doing it for the wrong reasons, and therefore that sacrifice is for naught or even worse, for something bad. So, sorry. I want to thank you all for opening this conversation about schools. This is really important. Um, I'm an educator. I started out in an alternative school in Portland, Oregon, when I learned my progressive politics from the teachers that I worked with. Um, and then I left three years later and started teaching in Hollywood, California. And I was lucky, I was very lucky, I got to teach sex education to seventh graders. And I feel very honored to have had four years of, no, six years of that experience with seventh graders. Um, very similar to what you were saying, there was real um, disputes going on about what we were teaching, what the curriculum was. But I relied on my Planned Parenthood curriculum because I knew it was honest and true. Um, but anyway, I'm trying to get to my question here. It's about the change in schools because of this, what I'm seeing is like um, runaway consumerism. You know, now parents have so many choices of where they can send their kids to school, and public school is just one small, one of those choices. Um, can you speak more to that about what, you know, our, our culture from outside schools is doing to change school culture? Sure. I mean, I guess I spoke. Thank you, first of all. Can I just ask you before you leave the mic of when you taught the Planned Parenthood curriculum? When was it? Okay, that's, sorry to like um, date. 1987 until 95. Okay, good. So thank you. That few because that totally makes those, my point. Those the best um, years. <laughs> uh, because this, these fights over sex education are often used as like, and then the right wing came in and they killed this great liberal curriculum. And see, you know, then there was this forward march of the right. But actually, Planned Parenthood came in quietly, district to district, and had much more progressive, adventurous stuff than what I was talking about. So um, thanks for being the living example and, of that and, and doing those the work. years have shown through the records that there has been a drop in teenage pregnancy since those years I mean absolutely it was successful just not to take up too much time with the school's point but to your point about choices well you know who has choices people of means have choices right and so I think that on the one I think there's a kind of culture-wide cross-class celebration of school choice right and that's something in many ways that are being is being marketed to kids that actually don't even have that much choice but um, people of means have always had choices right since the kind of rise of the voucher movement and now of this charter school um, program where in some places you know you can apply to lots of different schools get picked out of the lottery you're right that there are more choices in that regard too I mean one of the common criticism uh, criticisms of this is even though that form of more kind of working class school choice does expand the realm of choices and give you know, greater power to those to parents who wouldn't have had it by just going to their zone school. It also creates a, a, a kind of more permanent underclass of the kids whose parents just like didn't even know the lottery was happening, right? Or don't speak English. And if I don't want to make charter organizations like the big bad guys because I don't think they are. I think that's way too simplistic. There are efforts of outreach to bring in those parents. But there's also evidence, there was a big scandal in New York recently, there's also evidence of charter schools pushing counseling out the kids that are not um, letting them succeed on those test scores and then making them the more desirable place for parents to choose. So all of this choice stuff sounds really great, particularly if one of our shared American ideals is freedom of consumer choice. I think anyone can get behind that. But I think in education it has some real negative implications and I start to wonder, are the kids empowered consumers or are they the commodities, right? I don't really know. So I think it's worth thinking about. Thank, great question. Thank you. This is a question, I suppose, initially directed toward you, Natalia, but I welcome comments from the others. Uh, this discussion this afternoon of common schools and common grounds just got me to reminiscing a bit about my high school experience in the early 60s, when as I look back on it, there was a really what was called tracking. There was a, a group of us who were considered by testing to be college bound, perhaps going toward more elite schools. We got some of the most experienced and best teachers I know 
think looking back. There was another group who were going to go to maybe uh, state schools and, and what were then called junior colleges. They tended to get maybe other teachers. And then there were those going to uh, vocations, uh, so home economics as it was then called and so on. And then there were some who were not in the high school who were going to uh, out and out vocational schools for, for uh, skills. And so it just led me to, to wonder a moment or two ago, are we dealing here with, in a sense, a myth of a common school? I mean, we have common schools. Those people in my high school experience were all in the same building. And yet, without it being awfully explicit to my recollection, there was a lot of differentiation. Now some of the differentiation is taking place through charter schools, homeschooling, uh, and, and for various uh, reasons that we know. So I just wonder whether the whole idea of Horace Mann of a common school is to some extent an ideology or a myth, or is it something we ought to be reflecting about as we talk about commonness when maybe there wasn't as much as we really think there was? I took a, do, you, do you want to speak? Okay. So I think um, it's a great question, and I think that you're right. And you know, one of the first things that when I teach Horace Mann's vision of the common school to my history of education classes, that I'm, as I said, is this really so common? Who's being left out? Because it's so clearly a kind of Protestant worldview of who should be included in school. So I think that you're right that even in that founding philosophy of this rosy sounding inclusive universalist commonality, it's not, right? And we see that the minute that Irish Catholics come in and start resisting um, these schools and the King James Bible being taught is one of the first examples. Um, but I think that you're right. I mean, we've, we continue to struggle. The public education system in the United States, I don't think, has ever been common. Um, I think the period, and for what you're talking about, the other extreme example of that kind of tracking on ability, of course, <laughs> happens around race, too. That even schools that say, hey, yeah, we're desegregated, look how many African American and Latino kids are in AP classes. I mean, this is a persistent issue. I also think you bring up a really good point which raises questions about polarization, and I thought it was the direction you were going in, about testing, right? That you were in a school of tracking by ability. Um, the good side of testing, and this is what um, James Cohn and Bryan at Harvard originally thought, was you can pluck that diamond from the rough, right, who went to that school in the Midwest who didn't go to Groton and was bound for the Ivy Leagues. You can use tests to identify those kids, and real opportunities come from that. Of course, the negative is that when there's so much emphasis placed on the outcomes of these quantified measures, and when it's pushed so far below the college admissions process, I think it often sorts kids, and a lot of other people think this too, unreasonably, it also perverts the motives of teachers, right, and takes away their creativity. So yes, I agree, the common school myth has always been that, but I think it's one worth keeping alive and striving towards. Let's thank our guests very much for... Sorry to monopolize the question. Thank you. More fascinating things to think about. And I bet if you've been with us all day, you kind of know what's coming next. It's another 15-minute break. We have set up some snacks out there. Please enjoy, and we'll come back in and get to our last session for the afternoon before our programming break of the evening.